what would you think if I told you that there are more tigers in American backyards than there are in the jungle, and that there are more bluefin tuna in sushi than there are in the sea? Well, this is the ugly truth, and it's a situation that we've been ignoring for far too long. But you only have to turn on the news to realize that now is the time to act. As David Attenborough says, we have to recognize that every breath of air we take and every mouthful of food we take comes from the natural world. And if we damage the natural world, then we damage ourselves. We are one coherent ecosystem. Despite this, we know that humanity has already wiped out 83% of wild mammals and half of our plant varieties, which means that our world is now made of 60% livestock, 36% humans, and only 4% wild mammals. And I'm sure this isn't huge news to you. After all, we're all bombarded with depressing stories about the environment and endangered species every day. It's all too easy to feel helpless and far too hard to know what to do about it. And so here we are, just walking on by. Yet one of the fundamental aims of life is to make a difference, whether this is groundbreaking or personal, inventing a cure for cancer, or just making someone smile. And so what's important is that we don't just walk on by. What will it take to get you to stop? It might be the nature on your doorstep that inspires you. On the Somerset levels, the murmuration, where huge flocks of migrating starlings can be seen practicing their shape-shifting patterns in the sky, is enough to convince anyone that nature is magnificent and well worth our protection. For me, it was something rather different. I've loved lions ever since I was six and watched Born Free. <laughs> and it's given me such a passion for wildlife that, well, now I'm here today. At eight, hearing about Jane Goodall's amazing conservation work with chimpanzees, my head filled with dreams of becoming a lion conservationist and saving the world. To be honest, I wasn't quite sure what exactly a conservationist did, let alone how they did any of this but I just knew that I wanted to be one of those people that chose to stop walking on by. And so, when I was 10, <laughs> my friend and I decided to sell some chocolate milk on the side of the road to support conservation. And by my teens, I was volunteering with the Tusk Trust, an amazing African wildlife charity based near Shevin. I'm now 17. And I've had the amazing opportunity to have been able to follow my childhood dreams and work with lions. Most recently, this Easter, I volunteered on the research team of Salati Game Reserve in South Africa, which is where I first encountered Della. Della is a beautiful, majestic lion, and if you look closely, you can see the rest of his pride crouching in the grass. But I just honestly I don't know what I would do if I went back one day and Della and his pride just weren't there. Inspired by conservationists like Joy Adamson and Jane Goodall and horrified by the prospect of further loss of wildlife, I, like many others of my generation, refuse to walk on by. Because, and this is key, we have to act now. By the time that I'm 27, such iconic species as the African elephant, the Sumatran orangutan, and the tiger could be extinct and gone forever. And there's a very real possibility that these species are going to be gone before I ever get a chance to try to conserve them. The thing is, we've all read the headlines of animal extinction before. And I get that it can be hard to know what to do about it, particularly since many of these reports leave us with little or no hope for the future. So I'd like to talk to you 
about a project that does offer us hope, because it shows how small ideas and a collaborative approach can pull us back from the brink. A decade ago, Amy Dickman, a Devon-born conservation biologist, was faced with a dilemma while working in Tanzania. The natural habitat around the banks of the Great Ruaha River were shrinking, pushing the local lions and the Barabaig, a nomadic tribe, together. In the Barabaig tradition, young men often grow to become lion warriors, and now seeing their cattle killed and eaten increasingly by lions. The Barabaig warriors were killing the lions more and more frequently. So the dilemma that Amy faced was how to respect the Barabaig's tribal traditions at the same time as conserving lions. And just putting a fence between the two wasn't going to do it. Amy tried for two years to get a meeting with the tribe without success. And then one day, fate stepped in. You see, despite being an ancient and really traditional tribe, the Barabaig actually rely on mobile phones to track livestock prices, look for missing animals or humans, or give lion warnings. And so when Amy and her team put out some solar panels with a charging station for their computers, the Barabaig started turning up to charge their own mobiles. <laughs> and over time, the two sides started to understand each other. Amy came to appreciate the Barabaig's deep connection with the lions that they hunted, and the Barabaig began to show more of an interest in what Amy had to say. This was the beginning of a wonderful and highly unexpected collaboration. Soon, armed with a deeper understanding of the Barabaig and their motivation, Amy found a way to transform these lion warriors into lion defenders. And here they all are now, with Amy in the middle. By employing the Barabaig to protect rather than kill lions, this inspired idea respected their tribal traditions and utilized their excellent tracking skills, giving the Barabaig meaningful, culturally resonant employment with an income. And this project transformed the local mindset so that the people who will actually come into contact with lions every day want to save them. And as a result, Amy and her team have managed to reduce lion killings in the area by 80% in just seven years. This is Alex, one of the Barabaig's young lion hunters, now a lion defender. And he says, I wish the project could expand and reach all those in the Barabaig tribe in Tanzania, so as they could recognize and value the lions and other wildlife. Now, conservation isn't just about saving the big cats. Rewilding projects are springing up all around the world, increasing our biodiversity and bringing back our species, at the same time as creating a space for all the creatures, including humans, of course, to enjoy. Rewilding isn't about removing humans from the mix. It's about taking positive action to increase richness of life. So across the border from Tanzania, in Mozambique, the ecosystem and wildlife of the Gorongosa National Park had been torn apart by 20 years of civil war. Yet by working together, the conservationists and local communities were able to renew the area. And 40 years on, the park is in better shape than ever before. These hopeful stories are part of a much bigger picture that spans across the whole globe. So wherever you live, you can do your bit to help nature out. I'm ashamed to say that the UK lies towards the bottom of the league table for biodiversity. In 172nd place out of 200 countries, we need to get our act together. By manicuring our lawns and drenching our crops in chemicals for far too long, we have caused the insect Armageddon, where such amazing species as the tansy beetle, the bumblebee, and 75% of our butterfly species are plummeting in numbers. And without these ground workers of our ecosystems, we know that the fragile links between our food chains are going to collapse in on themselves in what scientists call a bottom-up trophic cascade, which, long story short, leaves desolate wastelands unable to support any crops. Fortunately, Sherbin has its own Amy Dickman to help. 
This is Leslie Malpass, and she founded Operation Future Hope, a program dedicated to educating my generation about conservation and who is bringing rewilding to this ancient market town. And so with the help of Operation Future Hope, my school friends and I are planning to transform areas of our school grounds into wildflower meadows and beautiful but unruly habitats designed to bring back our bumblebees and brown and gold skipper butterflies, which are going to pollinate even more flowers, enriching our biodiversity. We're even hoping that by creating the perfect environment for a barn owl, we might encourage one of these beautiful birds to make its home on site. This is a plan for uh, rewilding the area of our pitches by the main road, which you might drive past sometimes. And work has already begun. And now, within a square mile of this school, many other properties, like a business, a retirement home, a hotel, and loads of other schools have all joined in the rewilding. So I can't wait to see these wildflowers blooming right across our town to recreate our diverse and beautiful ecosystem. Seeing how quickly nature can renew itself is inspiring. But it needs all of us to get involved and play our part. The best thing about it is that we don't have to wait for the council, the government, or anyone else to take initiative. We can do our bit right here and right now. And so I'm going to just tell you a few simple yet really effective things that you can do to rewild your environment. For example, you could plant the right flowers for a butterfly or a pollinator garden. Or you could just get a seed ball, which I absolutely love, because all you have to do is chuck a few across your garden to scatter thousands of wildflower seeds, and then just wait to see what pops up. Another idea is to put a hedgehog highway through your garden by cutting small holes in or under your garden fences to allow these little hedgehogs to get through at night. And you can even sign up as a hedgehog street if you persuade your neighbors to join. Try to leave garden waste, dead wood, and rocks lying around to create a sort of bug haven. You can even construct it into an insect hotel, like this one here, which is very clever. And if you don't feel like making your own bug hotel, then you can buy smart ones, like this one, online or in shops really easily. And before you know it, they'll be populated by all sorts of little creatures. Now, water is a vital element for biodiversity. So try to introduce a water feature to your garden. A pond is perfect, but if you don't have one, then literally a pot or a dustbin lid filled with water in the corner of your garden will do the trick. And resist the urge to get your lawnmower out too often. Let the grass grow long. Caterpillars love it. There are so many small things that we can do to make a difference. And of course, we can also support our conservationists in their important work. While it's easy to think that just dropping a few pennies in a donation box or signing one petition isn't going to make much of a difference. Having volunteered for the Tusk Trust, I can tell you that every penny and every signature really does help. By doing our bit, we can make sure that the wildlife we love, from hedgehogs to lions, are still going to be here for future generations to see. And if you are inspired to take action, it's completely OK to start small. But just imagine a family walk through our beautiful Dorset countryside, empty of birdsong, butterflies, or bluebells, making it all the way to Africa, only to find it bereft of lions and elephants, and a holiday in the Indian Ocean, or instead of stingrays, angelfish, and turtles, you snorkeled through a sea of plastic and a coral reef bleached with color and life. The truth is, whether we live on Ackerman Street in Sherbourne or, or along the Great Ruaha River in Tanzania, we should all have a vital interest in conservation. The amazing thing about wildlife is that given the right conditions and the right environment, it will bounce back. And so whatever part of nature you love, 
and whatever you choose to do about it, from donating to a conservation cause you care about, to supporting community-based action, from letting your garden grow a bit wilder, to selling chocolate milk. You can leave the world a better place, as long as you don't walk on by. Thank you.